just give folks a moment to filter in. Welcome everybody, both on Zoom and on YouTube. And while the rest of everyone arrives, uh, I'll start out with a few logistical things. So welcome to the sixth week here of the fall 2021 iteration of the Long-Term Animal Research Seminar Series. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And uh, this week, we're going to be hearing from Alexandra, Alex, Jeb, and Dr. Elizabeth Tinsley Johnson. Uh, we'll hear from Alex first. And before I introduce her, I'll make a couple of announcements. First, if you're participating via Zoom, you should see a Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. If you open that tab, uh, you'll be able to type any questions that you might have, as well as see and upvote other people's questions. At the end of the talk, uh, I'll moderate a Q&A session when we go through them, starting with those with the most votes. Second, we're going to be posting recordings of these talks to YouTube shortly after they conclude for your viewing and reviewing pleasure after they're done. If you know other people who weren't able to attend live, please remind them that they're available online. So with that, I will start with our first speaker today, Alex Jeb, a PhD student in the East Bio Doctoral Training Partnership and studying at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Alex received her Bachelor of Science from the University of Liverpool and her Master of Research at the University of oh, goodness. I'm sorry, I wrote University of Liverpool twice, but I know that that's not right. No, that's right, that's right. <laughs> also at the University of Liverpool, yeah. wow, okay, sorry, thank you. Uh, she's previously studied parasite host interactions, mammalian communication, and the ecology of fear. And now as a PhD student at the University of Aberdeen, she currently studies early life environmental effects in yellow-bellied marmots as, well, uh, as a part of the long-term study at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. And we're gonna hear today about some of that work as it pertains to maternal strategies, which is a topic near to my heart. And so I'm really excited to welcome Alex today and I'll turn things over to her now. Okay, uh, is the sound all good? Alex. Sounds great. <laughs> Sorry, a <laughs> couple of technical hiccups there. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to share my screen. So we want this one. Can you see my presentation okay? Looks good. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so hello everyone. My name is Alexandra Jeb, like Matthew said, and I'm really gratified to be presenting today and not working on my thesis. It's a really nice break for me. Um, because I'm tying up my PhD. And I, like Matthew also said, I work at the University of Aberdeen, but I also have the kind guidance of my collaborators and supportive mentors, Pierre Bizet, Julianne Martin, and um, Blumstein. And they worked with me to put together this project on um, maternal strategies. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna deviate first to, uh, to flag my home country. So in Scotland at the moment, we are extremely excited to be holding the UN's 26th Climate Change Conference. And uh, there's a lot of excitement at the University of Aberdeen about world leaders gathering for 12 days of talks tackling climate change. And a lot of emphasis is going on around climate change research. However, despite the climate being a very high priority in scientific research, I'm here to talk to you today about the somewhat understated effects of weather, which might not take you by surprise if you live in the UK, as us Brits have a unique talent for discussing this topic at quite some length. Weather, as opposed to the longer term averages described by climate shifts, explains shorter term patterns. However, as with climate, weather can still be important for regulating the biology of many organisms. For hibernating species, weather plays a crucial role in many aspects of their year. Weather regulates the amount of food available, emergence and emergence out of hibernacula, and the resources available for reproduction. At this point in the story, I'm going to take a slight twist away from the introduction and with a little animation <laughs> pizzazz, introduce our long-term research system and location. So welcome to the Rocky Mountains. If you are a US citizen, you might have been there. 
hopefully you may have gotten to see something like this scene and visited it in the summer or you might be an avid winter sports fanatic and traveled there on vacation to try your hand at this in the summer this particular area of the rockies is rich and diverse and covered in wildflowers and all manners of vegetation However, you can also consider that living in this montane ecosystem can be a bit like living on the edge of life. Because for five to six months of the year, these areas can be characterized by barrenness and intense snowfall, making life difficult if you're relying on vegetation to keep you going. Which is what these guys do. So this is a yellow bellied marmot, a small cat sized rodent. Um, they are hibernators, feeding mainly on forbs and grasses while they are awake and hibernating away underground the rest of the year. And they sustain this hibernation through energetic body reserves or fat. <laughs> Crucially, previous studies on the site have demonstrated size is vital for overwinter hibernation survival. Um, and when they are awake, they like to breed somewhat prolifically. Territorial males are often central to a network of breeding females, which they defend from other males and they mate with these females. Breeding females tend to inhabit their own burrows, sometimes cohabiting with close female re relatives or offspring of the previous year. This is what uh, makes up what we call matrilines in our system, or we also refer to it as a marmot colony. Offspring are nursed by lactating mothers who tend to enter gestation rapidly after emergence from hibernacula. This makes a lot of early reproduction dependent on energy reserves from the previous year's active season before they can be recuperated as vegetation starts to grow and they start to eat a bit more. Actually, from other statistical models, we already know female breeding mass is highly tied to the mass when they went into hibernation. And it can also be affected by other things like the age of the mother and the location of the colony. Thus, the energy resources and condition of a mother is likely to depend strongly on the weather conditions. Both during the hibernation season before reproduction occurs and after in the breeding season, as you can see from this infographic, um, hibernation periods are characteristically seasons of continuous snow cover in this region. Annual weather variations, such as the amount of snow on the ground and the winter temperatures, will all help determine the severity of the winter and the winter length, which is determined by the date of snow melt. In the breeding season, weather variation in factors like precipitation and temperature will also help determine the amount of vegetation available to marmots and how quickly mothers can start to regain some of the energy they lost in the previous hibernation. So, Reproduction is costly and the costs vary across years, depending on how tough the breeding conditions are. In Itera para species, trade-offs exist between spending maternal resources on the current breeding event and also maximizing female survival to breed in the future. With years changing in harshness though, how do females make the best of bad years without wasting resources and also take the most advantage of years that provide suitable breeding conditions? One way that breeding females can cope with stochasticity and conditions is by employing diversified vet hedging strategies. Observed phenotypic variation within litters from the same female can be explained in this way. Imagine you have this highly hypothetical female guinea pig that I completely invented. She lives in an environment of stochastic temperature where the adoption of certain phenotypes will benefit survival, but only if she manages to match the breeding conditions. However, she is unable to predict these breeding conditions, and perhaps if she diversifies her offspring within each litter, she might have a chance of success across all of these conditions. Here I gave the example of different coat types to match varying temperatures. Some of the offspring would hypothetically be very short coated to match warm conditions and some long coated to match cold conditions. Therefore, the mother has increased the variation within a brood to decrease the variation in fitness gained across all the reproductive events in her lifetime. So to answer questions about whether diversified vet hedging was potentially a strategy employed by yellow-bellied marmots, we built linear mixed effects models in R. 
the phenotypic trait we were interested in within our system, because of its high importance for survival, was body mass. And as part of our mark capture recapture study, we sampled body masses from emergent litters in the active season when they were born. We took predicted values on a standard day, dyes date for each member of each litter and used them to calculate the coefficient of variation for body mass, which is essentially a measure of how diverse they are within a litter. For those interested, the coefficient of variation is just the standard deviation over the mean. Oops, I forgot about that. <laughs> When we decided on the fixed effects we would use, the main questions we wanted to test were, does annual weather condition influence, influence how variable the offspring are? And does the condition of the mother influence how variable the offspring are? We used data from our famous climate man, Billy Barr, and the local town's weather station to build two new variables of climate severity through principal component analysis. This meant that we ended up with one new variable that described how harsh the winter was in terms of temperature and snowfall, and one new variable that described breeding season conditions through precipitation and temperature. We also knew beforehand that survival of mothers is dependent on their mass and age, so we included mass at breeding and age at breeding as a way to show the effects of maternal condition. We also controlled for other variables in the system, although I'm not going to focus on them as much. We measured aspects of litter composition, like how many pups were in the litter and how sexually dimorphic the litter was likely to be via the proportion of female pups and the sex ratio. And finally, we measured aspects of female territory quality. In our study site, we have splits between animals living at higher elevations and others at low. Although the difference in these two sites is not too much in terms of meters, it is enough to change key aspects of marmot biology, such as emergent state and survival. And we consider high elevations to be tougher for marmot existence in general. We also included the effect of colony type. In this system, we have found that there are sites that tend to have permanent occupation and sites that are intermittently occupied. We believed distinguishing between these two allows us to divide sites into poor quality breeding grounds and better quality breeding grounds. The first thing that we found was that the variability in body mass within a litter tends to go up with the number of individuals produced. And two, is increased when colonies are more permanently occupied. The third thing found was that variation in offspring body mass changes with weather, but the existence of this pattern is dependent on the elevation the marmots are breeding at. In this slide, you can see two figures showing the predicted effects of the model between a scaled weather variable on our x-axis and the square root of the coefficient of variation on the y-axis. As the x-axis increases on the left, springs get colder and wetter. As the x-axis increases on the right, snowfall increases and winters are colder. The difference in the lines here show the relationships based on elevation. As you can see in both cases, the low elevation sites show no relationship between weather and litter variation, yet litter variation increases with wetter, colder springs and decreases with harsher winters. Interestingly, there was a study within the same project as ours that was interested in the effects of long-term climate shifts. As part of their models, they explained that increases in pup winter survival can be driven by wet active seasons, and pup summer survival can be increased based on warm winters, winters with less snowfall. So these giant red X's show where, according to their paper, survival of pups would be highest. And in our figures, this tends to reflect when the variation in pups is increasing. So at higher elevations, apparently better survival means more phenotypic variation. In these figures, we show that the variation within a litter changes with maternal breeding mass along the x-axis, but that this depends on when the weather in spring was dry and warm or wet and cold, or whether the winter weather was warm with little snow or cold with lots of snow. If you remember the survival results from the climate paper I just mentioned, according to this figure, pup survival is best in these environmental conditions this panel and this panel. So in favorable breeding conditions, 
variation in pups is increasing as mothers get larger or heftier. And in unfavorable conditions here, uh, variation is declining as mothers get larger. And finally, you'll be glad to hear I'm at the end of the figures. <laughs> and finally, in this figure, we show that the variation in offspring also depended on maternal age along the x-axis, but that the relationship changed if she was light, average, or heavy at the time of breeding. We expected heavier females to have more resources available, be more tolerant to extreme breeding conditions, and less likely to have to trade off current reproduction effort against overwinter survival, for example. This means we expect light females to be in the worst condition, and because we have demonstrated body senescence in marmots before on the project with this reference, um, we might expect the mothers having the toughest time to exist here, so older and lighter females. Okay, so with a little time left, I'm going to put forward my explanations for what we have seen here and hopefully put those figures in a bit more context. The first thing I will put forward is that diversified bet hedging is driven by being a qu poor quality breeder. Take this figure of the range of phenotypes against the frequency that they are expressed within a litter. Each line here represents a threshold trait for survival in good, average, and bad conditions. If you are a good quality marmot mother, you have abundant resource and it's easy for you to keep all your offspring in optimal condition and above these thresholds. If you are a poor marmot mother, you have limited resources, which you could split equally, but you might end up with all your offspring down here somewhere. The best thing to do is diversify your offspring across phenotypes so that at least some survive in a bad year and most survive otherwise. This is supported by our results, hopefully. <laughs> Mothers that are at lower elevations produce equivalently diverse offspring across all conditions. Mothers that are in tough elevations, however, produced more diverse offspring in beneficial conditions here. And less diverse in tough conditions down here. Look at how the graph pans out over this side. Probably mothers are producing variable offspring all the time up valley, but we only see the offspring in our data when conditions are beneficial. When conditions are harsh, it's possible the offspring are not viable and we never see them emerge from the burrow for us to measure. Basically, they're this fraction of individuals and they're disappearing before emergence. This result also worked for our figure on older females producing more variable offspring. However, everything then gets a bit confusing when we think about the relationship between maternal breeding mass and variation. Why do mothers that are large and in good condition produce more variable offspring, um, something a bit more like curve one, when we would expect them to do curve two? We didn't check, but perhaps mothers are also producing more offspring in these conditions, as we already know that maternal breeding mass is a strong predictor of the number of offspring. We also know that number of offspring drives increased variation in litters from earlier. And so is it possible that this is evidence of a strategy from the offspring? Whilst the mother's interests might be benefited by all offspring being uniform, the offspring themselves have selfish motives and trade off with mothers. Perhaps these circumstances result in increased sibling-sibling competition when the litters are larger um, for feeding, and this drives the disparity here. An exciting thought that I cannot prove at all, and it's speculation, but it's interesting me greatly right now. Um, so to conclude, I believe this study shows the potential for the existence of both maternal and offspring strategies in yellow-bellied marmots in response to differential breeding conditions. And I'll leave you with a cartoon from my favorite Edinburgh artist and say that we can't say these strategies are adaptive without looking into fitness. And we can't avoid that relationship forever. So thank you for listening. Thanks to all my collaborators, funders, and of course the marmots. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Else feel free to contact me here or send suggestions for a new Twitter handle because I'm open for something as interesting as Elizabeth's. <laughs> So thank you very much. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, I have. Let me start with the question, which is, I guess, about which is about mechanism. So 
you know, mothers are out here assessing their environment, they're assessing snowfall and temperature and, and their, their own body condition. What What is then, do you think, the mechanism by which they then either create or, or reduce variation in their offspring? You know, that's a very good question. And it's one that I've been thinking about a lot because when I originally devised my PhD project, I was supposed to work with my supervisor, Pierre, to look at uh, plasma markers that could convert mm. climate conditions into um, some kind of consequence for the offspring. Um, and we did, <laughs> we actually started on um, things, hormonal markers like leptin, and we thought maybe they were promising because um, they can be passed through milk to offspring, uh, but it didn't work for us. So now we're testing um, markers of oxidative stress to see if that will have any links. And that will be, if I manage to do it, my fourth chapter. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. I think given the time, we'll move on to Elizabeth. Thanks a lot for the talk, Alex. No uh, great job. Okay, so our next speaker today, I'm very pleased to welcome, is Dr. Elizabeth Tinsley Johnson, an assistant professor in the Human Biology Program and the Department of Integrated Biology at Michigan State University and co-director of the Capuchins of Toboga Research Project in Costa Rica. She received her PhD in biological anthropology at the University of Michigan, where she worked with Jacinta Beener studying geladas in Ethiopia and later capuchins in Costa Rica. Elizabeth is broadly interested in the ways that primates are shaped by and overcome challenges in both their social and physical environments. Uh, some of Elizabeth's current work focuses on the impacts of group size and composition on fitness and the use of vocalizations in mediating primate social relationships. And the way that Elizabeth works in and connects across two different primate species with different social structures and life histories is really enlightening and, and an exciting prospect for the future. So I'm glad to welcome Elizabeth now to hear about her, her work in sexual conflict uh, in geladas. And I'll turn things over to her now. All right. Thanks so much, Matthew. Thanks everyone for coming today. I'm excited to talk to you all about some of my research. Um, today, I'm going to be focusing on uh, research uh, from the Simeon Mountains Gelato Research Project. Um, so it comes from uh, long-term records from this project, which was started at the end of 2005 in Ethiopia uh, by Drs. Jacinta Beener and Dr. Tori Bergman. The project has long-term records that range from daily weather data to social behavior and hormone and genetic data, which are assayed non-invasively and uh, from non-invasively collected fecal and urine samples. Um, and I just wanted to start off by saying all of our, our work would not be possible without the work of our Ethiopian collaborators. So I'd like to give a special thank you to Ambai, Sete, and Ashete, who worked with me back when I was at the site um, and continue to work for the project today. So now I'd like to introduce you uh, a bit more to geladas. Gelada monkeys are endemic to the highlands of Ethiopia. They're found between 1500 and 4200 meters above sea level. They feed on grass and sedge leaves, and they exhibit a multi-level social structure where individuals form small reproductive groups or units, which vary in size from one to 12 adult females. And then these units form large bands that travel and forage together in the same home range. Females remain in their natal units while males leave at maturity, first joining bachelor groups, which can be seen lurking over on the outskirts of the band. And these bachelor males eventually challenge leader males for reproductive control of a unit an event known as a takeover, which has the potential to dramatically alter female reproductive patterns via infanticide. Infanticide is an extreme example of sexual conflict, which is when the evolutionary interests of the two sexes are at odds with one another. In the case of infanticide, males that kill dependent offspring benefit by being able to mate with the victim's mother sooner than they would if they waited for the current infant to be weaned. And females obviously pay the cost of the time and energy already invested into that offspring. And as a result, we would expect to see the evolution of counter strategies. For example, females may mate with multiple males resulting in paternity confusion. And this in turn could even trigger uh, a so-called evolutionary arms race. Um, 
Infanticide is extreme in part because it completely resets the female reproductive cycle, but it is not the only type of sexual conflict that can have this effect. And in fact, one suggested female counter strategy to infanticide is the Bruce effect, where females terminate their current pregnancy after exposure to a non-sire male. And as a result, the females reduce the costs of lost time and energy invested into a, a potentially poor re reproductive outcome. Um, which is also an idea known as the uh, anticipated infanticide hypothesis. Our understanding of how and why the Bruce effect evolved and the broader implications the strategy has is limited because it can be particularly difficult to detect it, especially in wild populations. Um, a recent analysis by our host here, Matt Zippel and colleagues suggests that it is likely much more common than we think. Um, and so to demonstrate quickly how difficult it can be, I'll walk us through our own case study, which also demonstrates uh, the importance of long-term animal studies. So this research was done by Dr. Ayla Roberts as part of her PhD work. Um, and Dr. Roberts actually set off to the field in Ethiopia um, with the plan of researching uh, mother-infant uh, behaviors and kind of uh, caretaking behaviors. Um, but when she set off to collect her data, she ran into the problem of um, not having many uh, infants to study, not having many mother infant diets to study, um, which anyone who does long term field research can be familiar with. The best laid plans never often work out the way you'd think. So uh, Dr. Roberts revised her plan, um, uh, implemented a, a really detailed uh, hormonal uh, collection sampling schedule um, to try to see if she could detect these missing pregnancies hormonally, um, because a lot of females don't really look pregnant. You can't tell until quite towards the end of their, of their term. Uh, so through this, lots of fecal samples later, um, Dr. Roberts was able to see that um, these missing pregnancies were actually um, failed pregnancies that happened after a takeover. So a new male came in um, and the currently pregnant female almost immediately terminated the pregnancy. Um, overall, about 80% of the pregnancies fail after takeover in our population. Um, and we have reason to suspect that this is, um, as we kind of laid out, um, an adaptive kind of counter strategy to infanticide from the female's perspective because females that uh, exhibit a Bruce effect um, have a shorter inner birth interval than those that kind of have the infant that is later killed by infanticide. Um, so they don't kind of lose as much time and, and effort. So today I'm gonna to continue this story and talk about the impact infanticide and the Bruce effect has on broader population level patterns and on individual fitness, specifically looking at birth timing and optimal unit size. Now, because individual reproductive success depends on a number of factors, including ecology and a species mating system, we need to be able to zoom out a bit to paint a complete picture of the impacts sexual conflict has on the system as a whole. And so first we're gonna focus on understanding the basic ecological factors that influence birth timing, and then consider the, eff the effect to which sexual selection alters these patterns. So gelatas are capital breeders, which means they rely on internal cues of condition like energy balance to time reproduction. And this means when food is scarce or when energetic demands are high, capital breeders are expected to be less likely to conceive. In the Simeon Mountains, there are two main ecological factors that likely shape energy balance for female gelatas. Uh, the first, um, rainfall, it's highly seasonal and it peaks between June and September. And this is particularly relevant for gelatas because they have the most specialized diet of any terrestrial primate consuming primarily montane grasses. In the wet season, grass makes up about 90% of the diet and is never less than about 50% of the diet in any month. And you can see in this video at the bottom that even in the dry season, when most of the grass is dead, gelatas are still kind of working and able to find uh, green grass to eat. The second uh, factor that we wanna consider is temperature, which also varies throughout the year. We see the warmest temperatures between February and May and colder temperatures during the rest of the year. 
For female primates, thermoregulatory demands due to extreme temperatures can make it less likely that females will conceive and successfully carry a pregnancy to term. And temperatures in the Simeon Mountains, where our study site is located, can dip below freezing during certain times of the year, and we even sometimes get hail. Moreover, we know that male gelatas are cold stressed, showing higher glucocorticoid metabolites when it's cold. And just a brief aside, what do we mean by cold stress? We measure stress hormone levels by collecting and measuring fecal glucocorticoid metabolites. And if you were wondering, do they really eat that much green grass? You can probably tell from the, the poop there that yes, they eat a lot of green grass. Um, glucocorticoids are often referred to as stress hormones because they increase in response to metabolic challenges, which can be due to either social or physiological stressors. And so if females like males are cold stressed, we would expect to see the highest glucocorticoid metabolites in the coldest months and the lowest glucocorticoid metabolites in the warmest months. And this is essentially what we see. So here we have uh, the residual glucocorticoid metabolites for females along the um, y-axis there with error bars denoting the standard error around the mean uh, for each month of the year along the x-axis. Um, and this is just uh, the residuals from a model controlling for other factors known to impact female glucocorticoids, such as age and reproductive state. And we see that females have the lowest glucocorticoids when they experience the warmest temperatures indicated by the red colored circles. And that's from March to June. Um, in contrast, they have the highest glucocorticoids when temperatures are low, which is between August and September and December and January. So our first goal in this analysis was to understand which ecological factors, food availability or temperature, uh, shape birth patterns. And to test whether rain or temperature best explained variation in reproductive timing, we looked at when females return to cycling, which is indicated by sexual swellings on their chest that signal that they're ready to conceive. We looked at when females actually did get pregnant, and we looked at when females ultimately gave birth. So we used eight years of demographic data for this analysis, um, and we found overall that females could return to cycling, conceive, or give birth throughout the year. However, we also identified a significant degree of seasonality to when these events occurred. Um, so in these figures, you'll see along the x-axis, the months of the year, um, and along the y, the total observed of the cases, which is also indicated in the gray bars, um, along the right side, we have the mean rates, um, which is also indicated by the black points. Um, so we see first that females, uh, there's a peak in returning to cycling uh, towards the end of the hot dry season. This coincides with a peak in conceptions that also happen around that time of the year. Um, and this in turn leads to a peak in births about six months later um, at, the, at the end of the cold wet season. So we see a fairly consistent pattern here when we look at female reproduction. Females begin to cycle and conceive in the hot, dry season and give birth during the end of the cold, rainy season. Together, these results show that in gelatas, temperature may represent a more significant constraint on female reproduction than green grass availability. Because females conceive when green grass is scarce, and in fact, this time of year is when we actually see an increase in the number of conceptions. And because it has the highest temperatures, it's also when females have the lowest stress hormone levels. So how might sexual conflict influence these patterns? The reproductive patterns I just showed you only included females that had not experienced a recent takeover, uh, which also happened to be seasonal in this population. So here we have the patterns of environmental seasonality we've already discussed, graphed out with temperature indicated in the black points, both max and min, and rainfall in gray. But in addition, uh, we see a distinct seasonal peak um, when male takeovers occur, which is in March. And that means that male takeovers have the potential to not just suck for the individual females that experience them, but to actually alter the subsequent timing of reproduction within an entire unit. So now I'll show you what reproductive patterns look like in females that experience these takeovers. And as a reminder, here are the patterns that we see when we remove any females that had recently experienced a takeover, uh, but following takeovers, things start to change. First, after a takeover, 
almost all females in a unit appear to return to cycling regardless of the time of year. Second, even though most takeovers occur right around the time that we see a peak in conceptions, experiencing a takeover actually delays when females conceive, which pushes the conception peak back about four months. And what we're likely capturing here is uh, in part a Bruce effect, females who were newly pregnant kind of right around the ecological peak in conceptions, but then experienced a takeover, terminated the pregnancy, and then conceived again with the new male. And finally, this not surprisingly results in a different birth peak. Females that experience a takeover are much more likely to give birth later in the year than females who do not experience a takeover. And together what this tells us is that although cold temperatures shape birth seasonality, male takeovers actually alter these patterns, resulting in females giving birth at potentially less optimal times of year. Takeovers and the sexual conflict that results including infanticide or the risk of infanticide and the Bruce effect can reset the reproductive cycles of females. And in group living species, these events can disrupt reproductive seasonality in the months that follow. Um, some questions that still remain to be answered in this population are what, if any, are the downstream costs to females of births timed off peak? Uh, like I said earlier, we do see um, females giving birth uh, throughout the year. Um, but for certain females in certain conditions, um, there might be kind of some longer term effects, whether it's infant survival or uh, inner birth interval um, for these kind of off time births, which we don't know yet. So now we'll turn to the question of optimal group size, which is another story of how ecology, mating seasons and sexual conflict all interact. Variability in group size within species reflects a balance between costs and benefits of group living. For example, individuals living in small groups may lose out to bigger groups when it comes to the control of key resources, while individuals living in large groups may experience high within group competition over resources. Individuals living in optimally sized groups where the benefits outweigh the costs should have the highest lifetime reproductive success compared to others in the population. And the nature of the specific costs and benefits should vary according to factors like diet. For example, folivores are thought to experience reduced within group feeding competition compared to frugivores and therefore should form large groups. However, Females in numerous folivorous taxa live in groups that are smaller than those found in frugivorous species, which is an observation known as the folivore paradox. For some folivores like elephants, within group feeding competition may still be high, thus limiting group size, or alternatively or additionally, sexual conflict like infanticide risk might shape group size. So for example, large groups may be more attractive to immigrant males. And by contrast, females in smaller groups may be unable to defend dependent offspring. As a result, the conspecific threat of infanticide has the potential to shape group size such that mid-sized groups are optimal. So for geladas, we know that large units experience takeovers more frequently than smaller units. Therefore, we predict that females in larger units would experience higher fitness costs due to these male takeovers compared to females in smaller units. Alternatively, or additionally, when takeovers occur, infants in smaller groups might have a higher chance of being killed due to poor infant defense. So together to test these predictions, we first examined um, at the evidence for an optimal unit size for gelata females. And we specifically started by um, testing if unit size predicted female death rates or reproductive performance, which we uh, used the term to indicate the production of surviving infants. Second, we explored the effect of unit size on variation in both inner birth intervals or IBIs and in infant mortality. And third, we examined how the cause of infant deaths varied by unit size, specifically considering the extent to which infanticide explained these patterns. Uh, the data for the study derived from 14 years of observation, and the analysis here is the work of my co-author, Jacob Fetter. Um, all, across all analyses, the main predictor of interest is unit size, the average number of females in the unit, 
And we included in all, uh, all the analyses, both the linear and the quadratic term as predictors. So I'll walk us through the results quickly here. So for our first question, uh, here we have unit size along the x-axis um, or the number of adult females, and then the female death rate along the y-axis. Uh, controlling for the effects of age, we found that females in small units had, a had an annual death rate of 10.4%, while females in, in medium and large units had an annual death rate of 5.8% and 7.3% respectively. For reproductive performance, we used a binary scoring system to assign female reproductive performance on a monthly basis. So females were assigned a one in a given month if they conceived an infant that survived to a year and a half, which was the mean age of weaning in this population. And females were assigned a zero if they conceived an infant that died before reaching that age, or if they did not conceive during that calendar month. We excluded all months and births after 2018 as the survival outcomes of those infants were not resolved by the end of the study period. And we can see here, um, we again have unit size or the number of adult females along the x-axis and the yearly rate of conceiving surviving offspring along the y. And we found that females in mid-sized units, which is about between five and seven adult females, were 17.6% more likely than females in small units and 39.8% more likely than females in large units to produce a surviving offspring. In these figures, both of them here um, and the ones that you'll see next, the confidence spans show the lower and upper limits of the model predictions with colors following unit size categories, which were used for visualization purposes. The size of each point is proportional to the number of female years observed at each unit size. And our next step after finding these results was to tease apart what was driving this pattern in female reproductive performance. Was variation in female reproductive performance due to female fertility or to infant survival? So first we assessed whether successful uninterrupted interbirth intervals varied by unit size. In other words, we only included interbirth intervals that did not contain takeovers or infant deaths, as these events can lengthen or shorten IBIs. And we found that the length of IBIs did not vary by unit size. So next we considered infant survival. The disappearance of any infant prior to the average age at weaning in this population is assumed to be a case of infant mortality. So here in this graph, we have infant age along the x-axis and the proportion of infants surviving to that age along the y. And you'll see three different lines for each category of unit size, which again was done for visualization. We found that 28.2% of infants born into small units and 33.8% of infants born into large units died before weaning, while only 10.4% of infants born in, into mid-sized units died before reaching this age. So our final question is why are these infants dying? Um, and we examined whether the probable cause of infant mortality varied with unit size. Uh, we assigned uh, the cause of mortality as infanticide if the death occurred within six months of a takeover and maternal death if the infant died within three months of their mother's death or disappearance. Here you'll notice again that we're graphing unit size by categories along the x-axis. Um, this was done again for uh, visualization purposes and all analyses included the continuous variable. And what we find here is that 9.1% and 12.8% of infants born into small and large units experienced infanticide, while only 3% of infants born into mid-sized units uh, experienced infanticide. So taken together, our results show that females in mid-sized units have the highest fitness. Females in mid-sized units die at lower rates compared to females in smaller units. And females in mid-sized units have higher reproductive performance than females in both smaller and larger units, which is primarily a result of takeover-related infanticide. Uh, specifically, male takeovers are more frequent in larger units and are more likely to lead to infanticide when they do occur in smaller units. As a result, females in mid-sized units demonstrated the highest reproductive performance 
And when factoring in variation in adult female death rates are expected to produce more offspring over the course of their reproductive lifespans than our females in small or large units. This work demonstrates how infanticide risk can act as a major driver of optimal unit size and raises the question, what can females in suboptimal units do, which we are still investigating. To put everything together, the dynamic of infanticide or infanticide risk and the Bruce effect change seasonal birth patterns and shape optimal unit size. We would expect to see similar impacts in other species where the Bruce effect occurs, which is again, more likely more common than we think. And I'll take just a couple minutes here um, to share uh, some of my work at the Capuchins de Taboga field site, um, where we're collecting similar demographic records on birth timing and male replacements, as an example. So the Capuchinos de Taboga research project is located in the Guanacaste province of Costa Rica. The tropical forest, uh, it, the Taboga forest is a tropical dry forest, um, there, which are widely distributed diverse habitats that support a number of uh, endemic species and also uh, tend to experience significant anthrop anthropogenic disturbance, um, which is true of this site as well. Tropical dry forests uh, are closed canopy um, and feature seasonal deciduousness. Um, and uh, they, th this forest in particular features a riparian semi-deciduous forest along the riverbanks and a palm forest, which becomes inundated during the wet season. So all told, there's a lot of variety in the habitat, both uh, geographically and temporally. Um, this field site uh, was started um, by myself and my collaborators, uh, Dr. Jacinta Beener, Dr. Tori Bergman, and Dr. Marcella Benitez in June of 2017. Um, and we also collaborate closely with um, uh, researchers across different fields and um, kind of research focuses um, and are working to develop this as a uh, kind of cross-disciplinary field site um, that is also net zero. Um, the site, uh, like Gelatas, the Capuchins live in a highly seasonal environment um, and demonstrate birth seasonality. Uh, the area experiences two distinct seasons, which I've kind of highlighted here in the shading. So we have in red, a kind of hot, dry season, um, and then in gray, a cooler, wet season. Um, the social system of Capuchins also makes them a likely candidate for the Bruce effect. For example, alpha male replacements often result in infanticide and in other populations have been reported to follow a seasonal pattern um, occurring at higher rates during the dry season. Um, and capuchins at nearby long-term sites show birth seasonality. Um, in other words, they can give birth year round, but also show a peak around May, which, um, uh, which, which corresponds to a conception peak in December. Um, but um, there's some indication in some of the published literature that these patterns shift following alpha male replacements. So I'm excited to dig into that more once we have a little bit more long-term data. Um, capuchins are also really great for this uh, question for studying group dynamics because group size comp composition, which is the ratio of adult males to females and habitat quality, um, all have a big impact on female reproduction, um, maybe even more so than size alone. Um, uh, the habitat quality can be hard to measure. So one of our first uh, attempts uh, at, at doing some research at the site was just to quantify and kind of describe uh, the site and the different, uh, where our different groups range, um, which you can see here. Um, so in these groups, we have uh, kind of three core study groups um, though we also have a number of unhabituated groups that range within this area, and they have significant overlap. Um, and you can also see a huge amount of variety. So Palmas is our biggest group, and it stays mainly in the, um, the, the annually flooded palm forest. Um, Tenori is one of our smaller groups, and they stay in this uh, very um, kind of fragmented, um, kind of mostly agricultural uh, border forest area. So there's a lot of difference there in where, what the groups are doing. Um, and so uh, that's kind of what our preliminary research has set up for us. Um, a lot of the long-term data uh, 
that we use to study animal behavior. It, it takes kind of learning from your subjects while you're in the field with them, um, as demonstrated by the research by Dr. Roberts, um, being flexible um, and kind of starting off by quantitating, quantitating these long-term quanti quantifying, excuse me, those long-term patterns. Um, so then you start to notice when things don't quite fit what you would expect, which is, is kind of what happened with my seasonality analysis. Um, uh, like I said earlier, as Zippel and colleagues point out in their recent analysis, we, we'd expect to see patterns like this, those presented here in other species where infanticide or feticide occurs at high frequencies and where the average turnover of alpha males is longer than the average interbirth interval. Um, so there are a number kind of listed there. Uh, I, I haven't seen any published research in capybaras uh, having the Bruce effect, but I strongly su suggest after going down a rabbit hole in the literature that they would be an excellent study species. So if there are any capybara researchers out there, I, I wanna talk to you. Um, and that's all I have for today. I'd love to take uh, questions at this point. Thank you. That was super interesting. So I have, I, well, people put their questions and I have a lot. So uh, let, I wanna start by uh, thinking about the group size results, which are really fascinating. It seems like uh, there is then support for this idea that, that small group sizes of females are are less good at doing whatever they can to prevent uh, male infanticide. So I'm curious what it is that females in larger groups are able to do mm. to stop Yeah, it. That's a great question. Um, I think we definitely need more detailed data on the, the actual behaviors that we're observing, which was, wasn't included here. Um, but but it might just be a numbers effect where like, that's something that I suspect is, is if there's only two adult females and they both have infants in a small unit, you're probably, you got to kill one, at least one, right? If you want a chance um, from the male's perspective, but whereas if you're in a larger oh, unit and at least some are receptive, um, there might be less of a, a pressure there, but I so it does so happen in large units too. Yeah. So there might be more motivation from the male's perspective in small units, just from stochastic. Yeah. We call it like effect. a dilution effect, like a pred mm. from a predator perspective. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, well, another question I have is about about birth versus conception timing in geladas. Mm. Is there a, an optimal time for infants to be born, and does it line up with when they actually get born, or is there a conflict between mothers and infants? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, because they're capital breeders, they're probably, you know, the they're not going to conceive if the mom doesn't have the energetic reserves to kind of see it through, or or if something were to happen, then the, you, you would assume the pregnancy would fail. So to that extent, maybe mom has the upper hand. Um, I think in terms of, so being born towards the end of the cold uh, rainy season does coincide with um, optimal green grass availability. It kind of comes right after. Um, and I, you would really have to look ahead, I think, to see what's going on at the weaning period, which would be right, maybe maybe ideally right before the, <laughs> the, the next rainy season, right? So that, you know, that you'd have that transition food availability. Um, but I think what's what's interesting is what would get at that question would be really trying to understand um, beyond takeovers and the Bruce effect. Why are some females still giving birth, you know, off peak or around? Like, what's allowing that to happen, and are there repercussions of giving birth off peak? The, this analysis looked just at um, infant survival of that specific infant, mm -hmm. which didn't seem to be affected. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I have at least two more questions. Uh, so the next is about capybaras. So I, I would love to hear, and this is a little selfish, but that's okay. Uh, what what makes capybaras a good candidate species for the Bruce effect in your mind? Yeah, because well, so so they live in like a harem like social structure, um, mm -hmm. and that seems you know so they have like the dominant breeding male coming in, and then uh, um, they you know, our rodents. <laughs> and so the Bruce effect being originally found in rodents, I feel like that would be a, a good uh, carryover to understand because we still don't really understand 
the mechanisms of it, especially in primates, right? So in, in mice, we think there's like a pheromone thing, but we don't really think that's what's going on in, in the gelatas. So, um, and they're just cool. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'll dig out the paper when I, I was trying to find it in preparation for this talk that uh, set me down that rabbit hole when I was writing the unit size paper. And I kept annoying my co-authors with like, like, Capybaras are really cool. They're like focused on the paper right now. <laughs> yeah. And then my last question is about the total range of group size in gelatas. It seems like it's really narrow from those figures that you showed, at least compared to maybe other circumstances. Um, so I, I guess that I, I don't know, I guess that's more of an observation than a question, but I, I, I guess I'd like to hear why, you know, it seems like there's serious costs to being in large groups from a female's perspective in gelatas. And I guess I'm curious to know if you think those are especially strong in gelatas or if gelatas are just better at breaking up into smaller groups than other primates might be. Um, just a little bit on why that range seems so narrow. Yeah. I think the, the multi-level social structure provides some buffer. So um, if you're thinking of like the band and the herd as primarily protecting from predation or providing some predation protection, they're getting the benefits of a large group, but then able to break down into a smaller social group um, to a certain extent. I think we see the larger range where things are not ideal um, persist for longer than you might expect, because females in large units, if there's a leader male, they can't, they, they try to go off on their own. He's going to have something to say about that. Right. Um, so often those fissions occur, uh, coincide with a takeover. Um, uh, and then also if, if you're not quite, if you're too big, but not quite big enough, when you fission, you're going to have a too small group, right. And maybe an optimally sized group. So there's that kind of uh, trade off there as well, keeping that going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well, two really great papers. I'm excited. I haven't read the group size paper yet, but I'm excited to go read it now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks for a really great talk. And thanks also to you again, Alex. And, uh, I, I learned a lot in both of these. Um, so thanks to you both. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. And everyone else, uh, we'll see you in the same time and place uh, next week. Great. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot.